and in particular his work in Islamic economics is quite uh, revolutionary, uh, leading authority in that field and uh, helping all of us understand and maybe uh, rethink uh, subjects like economics, statistics, uh, econometrics, and also not just uh, questioning the, the Eurocentric and the, the Western narratives which are embedded in these, but also providing alternatives. So uh, uh, he earned his PhD in in, uh, statistic, in economics from Stanford University and a master's in statistics from uh, Stanford University. And he has a bachelor's in mathematics from the MIT. He has also taught economics uh, at several economics departments uh, in uh, very highly ranked international universities like uh, Columbia, UPenn, Caltech, uh, John Hopkins as well as Lums. Uh, he is the author of several books. Uh, his uh, one book in particular, which is on econometrics, uh, called the Statistical Foundations of Econometric Techniques. It's it's widely used as a reference textbook for a graduate graduate courses worldwide. Uh, he has published over 100 articles in uh, top ranked journals uh, uh, and uh, with more than 1,800 citations. And he previously served as the vice chancellor of the Pakistan Institute of Development Economics and was also a member of the Economic Advisory <coughs> Committee to the Prime Minister of Pakistan. Uh, the topic for today is uh, history, the mother of all social sciences. And in this, we will be, it's an opportunity for us to look at history. We all, you know, we sometimes think about history as a thing about the past. But actually, history is about the present. It's about understanding the present. And uh, the present has many different aspects. And I think one uh, very important aspect of our life is the financial aspect. So understanding our present, current financial context uh, and using history for that, so that will be the broad theme for this today's talk. And within that, I think one particular element which is really important in finance is money. Right? I think all of us agree money is really important. So to understand the history and the nature of money that we have, uh, the modern day money, uh, so that would be the narrative and that would be the analysis which Dr. Azman would be sharing with us. And uh, uh, we're really grateful and thankful that he came all the way from Islamabad to the IBA. Uh, for this particular talk. So without any further ado, uh, I'll just ask you to thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. topics in a way that is at the level of the students. So after thinking about it, I realized that yeah, this talk is going to be too complex, especially to non-economists. So I'm going to talk about money separately. I have a weekly, uh, monthly uh, lecture on um, Islamic economics, which I'm trying to rebuild the uh, theory from scratch. And the next lecture will be about money and uh, a very unorthodox perspective. And so I encourage you to join the lecture. Next, uh, first month, first Sunday of every month, Uske, uh, you will get uh, links to that. So today I will be talking about more generally the idea of history and how it is actually very central to all of the social sciences. Okay, so uh, to get the economics uh, lecture, uh, you can join my weekly mailing list uh, and uh, you will get a notification about the next lecture. All right, so we start with the, anybody who looks beyond his nose and beyond his personal life concerns will be struck with the amount of wealth disparities in this world. So we have glittering high rises and massive amounts of luxury on the one hand and people living in tents and, and, uh, and camps and actually under the open skies and sometimes and often in the same country. I mean, there are 
homeless people on the streets of Los Angeles as well. And one of these is a shanty town in South Africa, and the other picture is Johannesburg, which is very, very advanced. So the question arises, why are there so many? Why is there such extreme inequality, which has been increasing over the past 50 years also? So, uh, very related to this question is, why is the West so far ahead of the rest. And so on this topic, there are zillions of books, literally, in, and I've listed just four of them here. There are at least 20 different major theses about this, and countless books and articles. And this is not just subject of economics, it's also in sociology, anthropology, everywhere else, this distinction between the West and the others is almost central to the uh, study of whichever social science you go, psychology. So this question is why, why is there such a difference? And a uh, uh, side question is th then that how can we become like them? And that's all what development economics is about how we can learn to be like Europeans. So then there are also a narrative which questions this idea that do we or should we try to become like Europeans? Is that what development is about? Getting more money? And so there are a number of these, these are just a few of the books which question this narrative and some of them say that this idea of development, development itself uh, means becoming like Europe because they are by definition the most advanced society on the planet and so to develop is to become like Europe. Now uh, as uh, people affect the rise and fall of development theory this idea that becoming like Europe is the and Europe is the acme of human civilization this has itself received major blows in the 20th century and now, uh, because this idea has been very much discredited, so this whole idea of development theory uh, has been called into question. But the mainstream narrative is still the same. This is more, mostly in the unorthodox circle. So if you go to any mainstream economics department, they will be doing this line which has now been rejected, that, that uh, to develop means to get more money. And uh, ministries of planning all over the world, ministries of finance, they are trying to increase GNP per capita as the means to uh, become developed, even though that's shown to be nonsensical by many uh, leading economists as well as non-economists. It's just the power of the narrative is so strong that it carries the world even more. So uh, one of the counter-narratives is that uh, this pursuit of wealth at all costs without any attention to uh, anything else is putting the future of the planet, actually the planet will survive, future of humanity at risk. And uh, there's a lots of uh, strong evidence for climate change, we can see it in our own lives. And uh, this climate change is uh, threatening to be catastrophic, I mean, it's a geometric process. Uh, it will uh, go slowly at first and then it will go very fast and it will has the potential of wiping out a large proportion of mankind. It has already wiped out a large proportion of animal species. So, uh, these are the bigger questions of life that we face. and uh, But you will not see any discussion of them in your classes. Uh, why are they not important? Should we be trying to develop? Should we be trying to get more wealth? Well, there is an accepted framework of answers, which are taken for granted. So they are never discussed. And um, these answers, which are assumed as a background basis of everything you're studying in all courses, assumed 
that um, life is about pursuing careers and uh, pursuing uh, becoming rich and famous maybe. So why is life about that? What is life all about? These are questions which are not discussed because there are certain items, uh, answers which are assumed. And where do these answers come from? They actually come from history, from not just history, but a particular view of history, Eurocentric history. So there are the so-called little questions, although if you think about it more naturally, then these are the big questions and the others are the small questions. So what should I do with my life? This is, this is sort of maybe a small question because I'm just one person, seven billion other people, they all have. So in some sense, from considered from a one perspective, it's a little question, but it is the most important question in my life. What should I study as a part of it? And where to plan to live? Whether I should emigrate from Pakistan, it's undergoing classic crisis, what career to pursue, who to marry, that's a big part of our life. Career, should I pursue career? Should I uh, invest in my family more? Or should I pursue larger social, change the world, bring revolution, and so on? So these are our three demands. All of them have uh, their own. Uh, so, how we answer the little questions, how I should live, are shaped by the answers to the big questions. But because the big questions are never really discussed, we take for granted a set of answers, and then we uh, then we uh, answer the so-called little questions in a certain way, uh, without being aware that our answers our answers are actually how we live. So, uh, how we live is shaped by a view of history, which is a Eurocentric view. So. Um, how does history shape our thoughts? Well, normally we don't think much about it, but basically capitalism is built on the pursuit of wealth. This is a Max Weber's insight. He said that the uh, spirit of capitalism is the pursuit of wealth to the point of being irrational. Because actually uh, wealth is useful as a means to an end. If you acquire wealth, you can use it to do many things which you couldn't do otherwise. But it is not sensible to pursue wealth as a goal in itself. No one should have the goal that I should die with $10 million in my bank account. It makes no sense. In fact, our Prophet said that. The uh, person says, my wealth, my wealth, right? Wealth is only that which he consumes. The rest belongs to his inheritors. So there's no point in uh, accumulating wealth for uh, my inheritors. So uh, that's one of the strong influences. I don't. I can't count the number of students who have come to me and asked, okay, what career should I pursue in which I will be able to make the most amount of money? So the, I try to persuade them that you know, that's not the goal of life, to make more money. But this is what students have been trained to do, that uh, the, the goal of life is to make more money, so I should pursue a career which gives me the most money. Maybe there are other careers which will give you more life satisfaction, but you have been told to pursue life satisfaction as a goal. So that's the influence of capitalist society on our <laughs> thoughts and actions. Then there is the thesis of Orientalism, which uh, Edward Said wrote a book. And basically, if you can boil down the thesis of Edward Said to one or two sentences, the Europe, Europeans conquered the globe, 90% of it. And they got a superiority complex as a result. And, the, and the, the, those who were colonized got an inferiority complex. That's not part of his thesis, but it's a consequence. So, one of the one of the forces which shapes our lives is the fact that we are uh, we have been colonized. 
So we think that we are inferior. If you look at, uh, you can find that manifestations of this in um, everywhere. I've given examples and so Even people who think themselves free of this are not. And then we live in a market society where market societies are designed in such a way that everything is for sale and uh, consumption is the source of pleasure. So when I think that what should I do with this evening, well, let's go to a restaurant and eat some food. Now, actually, if you, uh, when I was growing up, you could not spend 10,000 rupees on food because there was just not that kind of food was not available. And as we have uh, become richer, uh, we have developed into a consumer society and people have no money and they want to spend that money on luxuries. See, in Islam, yeah, if you have more than you need, you should spend on people who have less than what they need. And Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran, somebody asked him, what should we spend? Spend what is in excess, that is in excess of what you can use. If you have more than what you can use, then you know that there are many people who have less. And there are people who are, um, whose children cannot get uh, medicine for uh, illnesses they get there because they don't have the money to buy them. So why are we not, is that not worth more than a meal but uh, at the finest hotel? Of course, I think everyone would agree. It's not that we are inhumans. Everyone given the opportunity to do so, would um, contribute to saving the lives of children. But the society, capitalist society is set up so that uh, the advertisements for the finest restaurants are in front of you all the time on the social media, but nobody is contacting with the message that such and such a child is sick and dying and uh, he needs a little bit of money to help. If those messages were on the social media, we would actually prefer to do that. But uh, those opportunities are not made open to us because that's not the way capitalism works. So these are the uh, this is the way these are the forces which have shaped our society and these forces have shaped our minds as well. We think in these terms and we don't and we think of this as natural. We think it's natural to do this even though it's not. It's, it's uh, something which has been created by history. So the question is, how can we? free ourselves from these uh, ideas which have shaped our minds. So, uh, basically the, the clue is that the root of these ideas are the big questions which we have been taught to ignore. Uh, we have been given ready-made answers. So, for example, if you are an economist, then you have been taught that you are a unit of labor for sale in the labor market. And the worth of your life is the marginal product of your labor. So people come and think that if I get a job, uh, that the value of uh, my worth is how much I can earn. This is exactly what economics teaches you. And so if you can get a job at a multinational making a dollar income, then uh, you're golden. And if you can get a, a job in a local firm, well, you are B grade, and then there are C grades, and so on. So anyway, the idea that our lives cannot be purchased for all the gold in the universe, which is explicitly mentioned in the Quran and the Hadith, that we are precious beyond belief, this doesn't occur to us, that our lives are infinitely precious. So, <clears throat> first question that we must learn about is, who am I? And uh, there are many uh, ways to think about the answer. I'm not going to give you an answer because there is no answer to this question. The answer must be found by you because everyone is unique. Every single human being is unique. But one of the goals of a capitalist education is to turn you all into identical parts for use in a machine of production. So uh, everything unique about you is completely um, 
ignored and in fact uh, there are instruments used to turn you all into uh, wheels with regular gears so you will fit into the machine. No one ever um, addresses you as a person. There is a um, uh, sign in a Turkish madrasa, old, about which I have written. <laughs> it's called uh, in this madrasa we don't teach fish how to fly and we don't teach birds how to swim. So this is the thing that uh, you take the student as he is and then you help him or her develop their capabilities which they have been given with, which in which every single individual is unique. So this is exactly the opposite of what a capitalist education does. Standardize people into things which can be used in the factories as machine parts. So, uh, one of the goals, one of the one of the ways that this is accomplished is to teach you that accumulation of wealth is the most important uh, purpose of life. Because once you start, once you make start making money the goal of life, then you will automatically get trapped into the capitalist world because money is part of the capitalist uh, regime and they have the most, if you want to make the most money, you will have to play game, play ball with them. So, um, there are many different perspectives on what life is about and what human beings are and it is worth exploring all of them, but uh, given that I have an Islamic audience, I will take the Islamic perspective. So, Allah Ta'ala's message to mankind begins with This is very significant because Allah Ta'ala talks about reading and also talks about the pen. So, these, these are not accidental. Knowledge, uh, there are two ways to uh, perpetuate knowledge. One is the heart to heart and that is essential. That's why you need the teacher and that is why the Prophet ﷺ said. But uh, the other way is the book, and both of them are necessary. Otherwise, uh, and the book can contain inherited traditions. And if you look at the books, uh, they contain the knowledge of thousands of people working across centuries, billions of people working across centuries. You can't possibly uh, capture all that knowledge in uh, any one lifetime. So the books are also essential. So, Allah Ta'ala says, in the very first sets of uh, verses revealed to our Prophet Sallallahu So, although this is, uh, verse is actually past tense, to Allah Ta'ala future and the past are the same and he's actually uh, prophesying that he will, Allah Ta'ala will reveal to man a special kind of knowledge which nobody has and uh, what was that knowledge? Let's put that aside for a, a, a while because we are under the illusion that we know this knowledge. But uh, Look at the effects of this knowledge and you see that these were people, the ignorant and backward Bedouin, who became world leaders as a result only of this knowledge. Allah Ta'ala did not teach them how to build factories or how to uh, new methods of warfare. No, no material means, there's no bob of chemistry or biology or physics in Bukhari. But the knowledge that was given made them world leaders of the world and created a civilization which enlightened the world for a thousand years or more. So this was a very powerful knowledge. So, um, let me um, talk about my life experiences. This is because this is, see, I was trained in the best and uh, the best colleges uh, by Nobel laureates, and I was steeped up to my ears in the superiority of Western knowledge. I couldn't conceive of the possibility that this, anything was wrong with this. And then, for Allah Taala had the mercy on me, and for some reason. I started spending some time in Tabligh and after four months I was confronted with the dilemma that 
happened sometime in the 90s, which I have been pursuing ever since. So basically, there is only one idea that has been driving, as the driving force of everything that I have done for 30 years, and that is this. Allah Ta'ala revealed knowledge to mankind, and Allah Ta'ala says, this is complete and perfect guidance for all time and to come. And um, it is obvious that uh, anybody who has belief will say that the knowledge revealed by God to mankind must be infinitely superior to anything that mankind could ever come up with on their own. This is yani, fundamental axiomatic. If you don't believe that, then you can't believe in Islam. So, that is what I, um, um, after four months, I had uh, strengthened uh, faith in Islam, so I believed that with my heart. But all the evidence that I could see with my eyes and with my um, brains is in direct, direct conflict. The world is shaped by Western knowledge. I'm using the computer and the laptop and everything we do, this building which has been built by Western knowledge. So, on the one hand, it seems that Western knowledge is the most important type of knowledge on this planet. And on the other hand, Islam tells me that the Quran is the most valuable knowledge. And there's no way to resolve this conflict. I couldn't understand how. So basically, um, in the belief, I was taught that if there is a conflict between the evidence of your senses and uh, the faith in Allah, then you deny the evidence of the senses and you affirm your belief in Allah. This is what Iman bil ghaib means. Even so, even though it's very difficult, and even though when Musa is standing in front of the river and behind him is the army of Firan, and there is no means of escape. Go forward, you drown, and you go back, you are killed by the soldiers. And yet, you have faith that, don't worry, Allah Ta'ala will find a way for you. So this is what faith is, when there is no, no, uh, no possible escape according to your observational and empirical evidence. Still, you believe that Allah Ta'ala will save you. So, <coughs> on the one hand, we have our ancient books, which are completely useless and gathering dust, uh, intellectual tradition of a thousand years with Imam al Ghazali, Kindi, Farabi, Nasina, etc., etc., etc. Uh, but we are never mentioned in any of our curricula. We don't even know what they said. It seems completely irrelevant to our modern lives. If they were relevant, then somebody would have benefited from it. No. On the other hand, uh, what were they doing? So, ultimately, uh, so I, I believed, but I couldn't understand, so I made dua to Allah. Show me, open this. Allah, Allah is the nur of heaven. Allah Ta'ala says that He will lead those who believe to the nur, to the light, and light is always knowledge. And those who don't believe will be led to the darkness. But my eye showed me that the opposite is true. Those who didn't believe had all the knowledge in the world, and those who were believing in Islam had were in the darkness, they had no knowledge. So what is this? Paradox and dilemma and contradiction and conflict. This was extremely troublesome to me. And I just made dua, Allah, open this to me, explain this to me, make it clear to me. And very, very gradually, not in a blinding flash of insight, step by step, I started to unravel the economics that I had been taught that by the best teachers I said, oh, there's a problem here. Okay, so there's another problem there. And slowly, bit by bit, the whole uh, thing unraveled. And ultimately, I came to realize that everything I had learned in my PhD was wrong. Everything was wrong. But it didn't happen in one day. So the question is, what was this knowledge that changed the world? One thing that is sure is we don't have it. 
because that knowledge, if we had it, we could also change the world. At least we would know what to do that is required to change the world, but we don't. So today, nearly everybody in the Ummah believes that we need to learn from the West in order to make progress. And not that we need to learn from the Quran to make progress, because the Quran we already know. So this is the greatest problem, that we don't actually know the message which revolutionized the world. So, <clears throat> uh, this again I came to gradually. In the West, they rejected Christianity. And after rejecting Christianity, they had to find another religion, something to believe in. And they started to believe in science. So science became their new religion. There's a process which has been called the deification of science. So, <clears throat> they said that, the, what is science? Science is the study of external world, not the study of your internal world. So, they said that that is what matters, that is the only source of valid knowledge. That is objective. <clears throat> what is subjective is what is inside my heart, that is not knowledge. It's just, you know, just give me the facts, I don't want your opinion. So, this is a very, putting a, uh, devaluing human beings. And um, if we consider the question, how should I live, you will not, and, and this is the most important question for us, I said this is one of the little questions, but actually for on an individual basis, this is the most important question that all of us need to learn to answer. How should I live? But if you will not find the answer in the books of chemistry, biology, history, and physics, and mathematics. So, uh, this is the knowledge which Quran gives us. The knowledge of our internal world, and how to live our lives. And this is the most important kind of knowledge. So, <clears throat> one of the elements of this knowledge, the central, is that لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانِ فِي أَحْسَنِ التَّقْوِيمِ سُمَّ رَدَدْنَاهُ أَسْوَلَ سَعْفِلِينَ In each of us, there is a possibility to become the best and also the worst. So we can rise above the angels and also become worse than the beasts. So life is about realizing this potential learning how we can be better than the angels. And this knowledge is not contained in any of the books that you will find in the West. So, because the books of the West teach you how to make more money, they don't teach you how to become a better person. And this knowledge you can only get from the teaching of Islam. And this is what our intellectual tradition is about, which is considered as useless. And this is useless if you, if you want to look to our books to learn how to make more money, you will not find anything in it. But if you look to the vex of the West to learn how to become a better person, then you will not find anything there. So the question is, which knowledge is more important? It took me a long, long time to get to this. I'm sorry, I'm saying this very easily. But. So, how can we become the best possible? Allah Ta'ala has put in us, it's like a seed. He has created great potential. Within a seed, there is a possibility of becoming a tree. And in fact, that tree has thousands of other seeds. So one seed can has within it millions of trees. This is why Allah Ta'ala says in the Holy Quran that if you save one life, it is like you have saved the entire humanity. So from uh, my mathematical perspective, I got my degree in math. It just didn't make any sense. How can one equal seven billion? Uh, but if you think about it in terms of the potential, every human being has the possibility of changing the future of humanity, the lives of, uh, impacting the entire life. And we have seen so many examples of how this has happened, how many people have changed the lives of. So we have this potential. But uh, how to realize this potential? It is knowledge that will create this. So Allah Ta'ala taught Adam alayhi salam the names 
And what were these names? Again, there is a huge debate and there are some very deep issues involved with this teaching of names, which one doesn't understand because we are never trained in, the, in this philosophical tradition. Mm -hmm. says, are those who know equal to those who do not know? He's not talking about MBAs <laughs> or other. Uh, this knowledge is, is the precious knowledge. So the uh, way to realize our potential is to gain knowledge but knowledge of a specific uh, kind. And um, if you don't acquire that knowledge, that's why I said that, I have said that, this European education that we receive is toxic because it prevents us from uh, realizing, our, recognizing our potential and it prevents us from acquiring the knowledge required to realize that potential. So I have a... Uh, video on lessons which MIT did not teach me. Uh, and um, as a 16 year old at MIT, what I really need to learn, and this is from perspective of 65 year old, so um, what I really needed to know was, and just in terms of uh, worldly life, I need to learn social skills. But I didn't get any of that. I was a like my fellow classmates at MIT, I was an extreme introvert because to, to excel in your studies, you have to have, uh, you, have you have to have amount of information, you have to have funds, otherwise you'll focus more on people, otherwise you'll focus more on so, people. Instead of so, uh, helping me instead of uh, develop uh, my helping me to uh, develop which is my what I desperately need personality. Which is what uh, I guess uh, they actually encouraged me to become uh, worse. Uh, they actually uh, encouraged uh, me to become worse even more and um, become even more pathological as a personality by uh, became even more introverted and specialized on those skills which have nothing to do with the real world. So I have said earlier that everything I was taught at Stanford, PhD, economics was wrong. Everything, literally. So many people, uh, I've been in many seminars and everybody gets very, very, it's very annoyed, especially economists get very annoyed. And they say that, no, you shouldn't, you shouldn't do such a blanket rejection and uh, you should say that, yes, we should take, take the good and reject the bad and that is the way of the Prophet and that is, uh, Prophet Sallallahu took the technology of the Khantak from the uh, others, and Persians and so on and so forth. There are many, many examples. So, um, I can give, uh, um, basically, um, if, if I want to hedge a little, what I can say is that the knowledge that is taught in the textbooks all around the globe, this is all completely wrong. Now, Western economists, there are many heterodox economists, and they have studied they have rejected neoclassical liberal economics, which is the strongly dominant school. And so they have some insights that are valuable. Uh, but uh, this neoliberal economics, this is complete garbage. And uh, although they trace their tradition and heritage back to Adam Smith, it's not true. Uh, this modern economics was created in early 20th century under the influence of logical positivism and created by Lionel Robbins who re redefined economists. Economics as being about the science of scarcity. Prior to that, economics was about the science of human welfare as created by material consumption. So they, uh, prior to scarcity, economists differentiated between needs and wants and they said that, you know, feeding the poor creates more utility than uh, listening to music, which is, uh, but after the scarcity definition, this distinction was rejected. And wants and needs were put on par, and there was only scarcity, not having, so the job of the economist is to fulfill all the needs and wants. 
this is false. In, in, in Islam, we are taught that Kulu Vashrabu Valanda Shrabu, which basically means that you are welcome to, uh, yani, uh, you are encouraged to fulfill your needs and even your comforts. Uh, you can wear your uh, dress of uh, decoration, but not uh, to overspend. But in economist, in economic theory, there is no such thing as overspending. And there is no such thing as luxury. There is no such thing as israf. So this is a, 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 once you take this into account, then all of economic theory, modern economic theory collapses. Once you say that there is a difference between needs and wants, and that our job is not to fulfill wants, in fact the Quran strongly discourages fulfillment of ideal desires, then you get a completely different economic theory. <coughs> So, there are, uh, as I said, heterodox economists have, in fact, uh, uh, explored alternatives, and they have some wisdom, so I'm saying that it's not all of the West is wrong, it's just that the orthodoxy of economics, even when I was studying in graduate school in 1970s, uh, the Chicago school was not dominant at all. In fact, in my university, they said that these people are just ideologues and they don't know anything about science. But there was a coup, intellectual coup that was performed in the 70s, it was going strong. Reagan, Thatcher implemented it and ultimately the Keynesian economics pre-Chicago school was discredited and Chicago school took over and is currently dominant all over the world. So, regardless, I mean, even though the heterodox economists have some insights, uh, they are still starting from the wrong place. Their economics is the economics of conquest and colonization. So, we want to discover an economist, economics of the colonized and the conquered, we'll have to start in a different place. So I mentioned already about the Orientalism by Edward Said. This was a game changer, both uh, in the world, because basically what Edward Said said was that all of European knowledge about the East is influenced dramatically by the fact of the global conquest. So, uh, All right, so how does this affect us? Well, we are also studying Western knowledge, so we also acquire this complex, but on the opposite side. And um, how, what is the instrument by which people say that, you know, colonization ended 70 years ago, so how come our minds are still colonized? The instrument of colonization is education. The education you, you receive is the means by which your minds are colonized because it teaches you that Europe is the most advanced civilization, European knowledge is the only thing that is worth acquiring. Why? They don't never say that explicitly, but that's all you're taught. So automatically you learn that Western knowledge, knowledge created over the past three centuries by the West, is the only important knowledge in the world. West doesn't matter. So you're taught to revere the West and also you're taught uh, contempt and shame for your ancestors that for a thousand years they didn't do anything. Muslims didn't do anything. So this is actually uh, because of a fabricated history. A fabricated history which erases the Muslim contribution. <clears throat> there is a particular strategy that was used to erase the Muslim contribution. 500 years of uh, Muslim advances in science, they've all been removed from the picture by a simple strategy. Anything, um, anything that the Muslims did, uh, either you put it back to a Greek or you put it forward to the European caucus. So all of the 500 years disappeared. This is detailed in my article. So, <coughs> In order to 
uh, relearn. We have to, in order to understand what really happened, we have to relearn history. And basically, um, I'm not going to go into details because it will be too long, but uh, Europe entered into the Dark Ages with the uh, Council of Nicaea, at which one version of Christianity, Trinitarian Christianity, was imposed by Emperor Constantine on Roman Empire, and anything which conflicted with that was removed. The Library of Alexandria was burnt, and all knowledge was suppressed, except for Orthodox Catholic doctrine. So that will happen somewhere in um, uh, 300 BC. So after that, um, basically uh, until around uh, uh, 1295, 500 years of Islam arose in the 6th century. And then um, in uh, 12... Uh, 70 or so, 1260, uh, the reconquest of Spain was begun and the Toledo, city of Toledo was captured. So we basically went to visit Spain, but it was quite an experience. <clears throat> so this time, instead of burning the libraries, the Europeans started translating the books of the uh, Muslims. And of course, see the strength of the Islamic civilization, why did it prosper for a thousand years? And it was a unique example of history, because Islamic center centers around knowledge, the acquisition of knowledge, the property. Knowledge is the lost property of the moment. Search knowledge from your cradle to the grave. So because the Muslims centralized knowledge, they gained ascendancy in the world. Today, knowledge is not to be found in the Islamic world. And that's why uh, we are in the darkness, because we're not following the commands to pursue knowledge. So after the translation of Project of Toledo started, then uh, light started to enter into Europe. And uh, this, uh, all of this knowledge was in conflict with Orthodox Catholic doctrine. So for two centuries, a battle was fought, which is described in many books, the battle between science and religion. But we don't, uh, but that's not really what it was. The, the battle was between the Islamic uh, texts. It's not actually Islamic. When I say Islamic, these were not texts about religion. There were millions of books in the libraries of Toledo. They were about philosophy, science, biology, chemistry, medicine, everything you could think of. Because Islam does not differentiate between secular knowledge and religious knowledge. Unlike today, where we have learned to make this distinction, there is no distinction. Knowledge is knowledge. All knowledge is one. So, this uh, new knowledge, uh, church tried its best to suppress it. The Inquisition was created to suppress this knowledge. I didn't know that until recently. That I thought it was about the, it is. it was partly about the remnants of the is Muslims who were left behind. They were forcibly converted into Christianity. Anybody who was uh, found practicing his religion was uh, burned at the stake or other things like that. But this was not the main function of the Inquisition. The main function of the Inquisition was to prevent this new knowledge, which was in conflict with Catholic doctrine, to come in. They had this, uh, every book had to be censored, they had to be approved by the Catholic Church, and uh, people who were translating Islamic books, people were getting a lot of knowledge. In fact, uh, Descartes, who is known as the father of uh, Western philosophy, basically translated Imam al-Ghazali's book. And the uh, passages are almost you know, clear. You can see passage for passage that he has copied. But to this day, uh, uh, Western historians don't agree with this and uh, don't. Similarly, Copernicus, famous revolutionary, translated a book by Ibn Shatir, which was in his library. But still, um, they don't, uh, uh, the Western uh, historians don't agree to this, uh, even though the evidence is so strong that it's possible to reject. Anyway, 
So this battle took place between the Catholic Church and the influx of new knowledge, which was called science. And eventually the Catholic Church lost. But the uh, tension uh, created by this uh, created a rift in the church. It led to the Protestant faction emerge, which adopted many of these new ideas coming in, which were in conflict with the Catholic doctrines. And then <coughs> the, there were battles between Protestants and Catholics for a century, ending with the Thirty Years' War. And this battle really soured the Europeans on religion. But when a very explicit impact, you must understand this, that there, there is a tradition called the scholastics. Or the, and these people, they were developing a theory of society based on the Bible. This tradition was rejected. And why was it rejected? For the very sensible reason. They had experienced that religion only leads to war. <coughs> so, uh, they said, okay, uh, we have experienced 100 years of war, can't have more of this. So they changed the meaning of the word religion. Previously, religion in the uh, West was like religion here. It's all-encompassing. It covers all areas of life. But in the West, they said, okay, religion is just going to be, from now on, a personal belief system. You can believe whatever you want to, but don't bring it into the public sphere. So even now, in, in the West, it's not uh, considered uh, uh, good manners to discuss religion with anybody. You can talk about any topic you like, but you can't talk about religion uh, because it's not something for public sphere. It's your private belief system. So, uh, but, but more importantly, more urgently, how to build, what, what should politics be like? What should international relations should be like? What should uh, government be like? All of these questions were answered by Christianity, by the scholars. But they said, no, we won't accept these answers. So we have to rebuild knowledge from scratch. <coughs> so all of knowledge had to be rebuilt from scratch. Because once you relate, reject religion as a basis of knowledge, you have to start from zero. So philosophy is the mother of all sciences. They started with Descartes who says, okay, let's start from zero. The first thing I have to establish is my own existence. Do I really exist? So I think therefore I am. That's it. obviously the first place. In fact, this is identical to the question that uh, Imam Ghazali posed that there are so many different claimants to truth. How do I know what is true, and uh, how, uh, and I must start from zero. So he says, okay, let's start from zero and find the truth. And he says that we can't get anywhere. To start from zero, it is impossible to make progress, because to make progress, you have to have something. Where are you going to get that something from? He says, if you use your aql, it can't get, aql only gets from one premise to the next. It, it doesn't give you the, if you start with observations, they are also <coughs> not certain. So there is no source of certainty. And then he said that I fell into depression, and ultimately, God put a noor in my heart, which removed this depression. And so basically, all knowledge starts with the noor of the heart. But <coughs> this could not be accepted by Descartes, so he started from some other grounds. Okay, so that's philosophy, but basically, from the practical perspective, a political science was the most important thing because that was what was leading to warfare. So they needed a new type of political science and so many, many uh, enlightenment philosophers uh, discussed political science, so Hobbes and uh, Montesquieu and many others. But basically, you know, Hobbes starts with the premise that the natural state of humanity is war of all against all. Where does that come from? That comes from his personal experience. He saw that for 100 years people were fighting its family against family because the Protestant Catholic divide was not uh, restricted to region. Uh, within one family, you would have some people who were Catholic and some were Protestant. So 
So the second field <coughs> to be built was uh, economics and uh, slowly the remaining social sciences. So basically, um, as a result of rejection of Christianity, they eventually Christi uh, they lost faith. And again, this is oversimplification, but <coughs> uh, if you look at the 19th century Western social philosophers, nearly all of them had personal crises. Any Nietzsche went insane and other philosophers, they, they also had psychological crisis. Because when you reject God, you are placed in a very, very uh, unpleasant world where uh, the poor, the oppressed, will never be uh, given justice. And if somebody does enormous amounts of zulm, there's nobody watching, nobody cares. This universe is a harsh, cold, and cruel. And this is what Bertrand Russell, who was the 20th century uh, leader of atheists, he says that everything is meaningless. Uh, what we believe, what we, how we act, whether we have huge vision or not, all, it will all uh, end with, and it's just uh, the result of chance collisions of atoms and it will all, all end with the death of the universe. So only on these truths, only on the firm foundation of unyielding despair that can we build the soul's habitation. So this is very um, artistic language. But uh, this is the result of rejecting God, that life is meaningless. So <clears throat> a lot of the 20th century was spent in trying to find a solution to this question of meaning of life. So existentialism, which I studied in um, 1971 in my course uh, in MIT, um, it says that, okay, so we are born, uh, the, the uh, key words are essence precedes, uh, existence precedes essence, that is our, we come into being first, and then we create meaning. So, see when God creates the universe, then our life is part of God's plan. And so meaning to our lives has already been written in the book before we were born. But if this universe is completely meaningless chaos, then there is no meaning to my life. I can create meaning. And so that's what existential is about. How do we go about creating meaning? But the absurdists, another school of thought, said that, no, this is nonsense. We cannot create meaning. This is, life is inherently absurd, and we must learn to live with it. And there's nihilism that we cannot really learn to live with it. It's, it's uh, the only serious philosophical question is suicide. So basically, absurdism and nihilism are similar in the sense that they both accept that life is meaningless, but one has a more optimistic and cheery attitude that yes, it's okay, we can uh, live an absurd life, and the other says no, this kind of life, is it really worth living? What makes it worth living? How can we make it worth living? <coughs> <coughs> So these are the big questions within which uh, we must answer our uh, little questions. And uh, since life is meaningless, so there is no point in discussing the meaning of life. You will find your own way. And meanwhile, I can feed you this nonsense that life is all about uh, making money so that my capitalist system can work. <coughs> So the question is, uh, should we accept, or can we, or must we accept meaningless? This is what Russell says, that we must accept this. This is the logical demand of reason that it's impossible that God exists. And there are a number of books <coughs> proving that God does not exist these days. But um, can non-existence of God be proven? Uh, People who <coughs> make such arguments have really a very, very shallow understanding of philosophy. 
because it's very simple. It's very easy to show that you cannot prove the non-existence of God. It, it's very easy to show that. Basically, uh, let me give the argument because it's so simple. <coughs> and there are many other simple arguments. But basically, universe started with the Big Bang. So the question of who created the universe is outside the universe, obviously. Whatever it was, it happened, whoever it was, whatever it was, it was before the birth of the universe. Now, according to the physical laws, there is no possible way that we can get information about anything lying outside this universe. That's why uh, physics is the study of objects within this universe, and metaphysics is the study of what is outside this universe. So the question of whether God exists or not is a metaphysical question. It is, lies outside the bounds of what we can see, and therefore, uh, it's only subject to speculation. You can't prove the existence of God, and you can't disprove the existence of God using logic. Okay. So, to understand how the Europeans came to um, believe in um, the uh, non-existence of God, uh, we have to study. See, <clears throat> we are used to thinking that our thoughts come from reason, but this is not true. Our thoughts are really shaped by history. So if you want to study how we think, how they think, and how we have been influenced by how they think, then we have to study the streams of history. And so we have to study how Europeans lost faith in God. And so it's a long and complex story which I will skip. But basically, over a long process, uh, religion became marginalized in Europe. And uh, Tony in his book says, that religion, which was the master interest of mankind, dwindles into a department of life with boundaries. And the whole book, Religion and the Rise of Capitalism, is about this process which took place over the course of two centuries. So one of the keys here is that the Bible says that the love of money is the root of all evil. And that was the social consensus in the 16th century. But in the 18th century, the social consensus became that the lack of money is the root of all evil. So it was a dramatic transition which took place in European thinking, and we have all, we have all come to think like Europeans. So social science was a replacement for Christianity, as I already discussed. So social science is really a religion of Europe. It is, not, it is what replaced the Christian religion. And therefore, at its foundations, it is in conflict with religious ideas. <clears throat> so, the basic uh, foundation of all social sciences, inclu economics included, and your MBA included, is that there is no God, no judgment, no afterlife. That we start with that as a premise. So, universe and life are meaningless accidents. So, then, given that this is, uh, this is so, then life, uh, man is just another animal, and life is a jungle of competition, survival of the fittest is the only morality and so the purpose of life is pursuit of pleasure, power and profits. This all is natural once you reject God, judgment and afterlife and these lessons are built into everything that you read. Everything in your, this is the, the core of a western education. These ideas which are never explicitly expressed, they were explicitly written then you could think about and reject them but they are just assumed without any discussion. So, um, we need to develop an Islamic uh, alternative urgently, and I have um, a couple of lectures on this, uh, and also a lot of other people in the Islamic world are uh, becoming aware of the need of this. Rajab Shantur has been doing a lot of work on decolonizing the social sciences, and he has uh, Basically, um, the need to do is what is called a rooted revival, that we have to base the revival on our own intellectual heritage. We can't just pull it out of nowhere, because the heterodox, uh, heterodoxy in the West is also developing critiques, but those are not useful for us. 
because they are not rooted in Islamic intellectual tradition. <coughs> I have <coughs> developed a proposal which I have called Ulumul <coughs> Quran based on the work of Ibn Khaldun because we need to reject all of this three or four centuries of European work. So we have to go back to our own roots and actually all of the social sciences, um, Ibn Khaldun has been rightly called the father of social sciences because he was the first one to do an analysis and he says that also, that I'm the first to do this kind of analysis about how um, there is systematic uh, change in social change and how the process of social change can actually be subjected to intellectual analysis. Nobody had done that before. This was just a collection of events. This happened, then this happened. What he was trying to see was a logic of history, how history flows through forces which are larger than uh, individuals. So one of the key insights of the uh, Ibn Khaldun is that the communities are the drivers of social change and communities formed by collective identities. And so <coughs> uh, this is very much strongly in contrast with the um, economics view of the world or generally social scientific that uh, life uh, is just everyone is an individual there is no such thing as society except for a collection of individuals and so one of the practical implications of this is that there is no possibility of collective action by individuals Collect because they, they all have different goals <clears throat> so collective action can only take place at the government level and this has blinded Muslims to the possibilities for change today. But while Halak says is that the nation state, which is a creation of Europe, is actually built on concepts which are antithetical to Islam. And uh, to, be, you know, to make it very simple, uh, the nation state puts the state, uh, gives the state the authority to create morals. And a uh, nation state is above all other authorities. In an Islamic state, God is above all, and even if there is 100% majority agreement that LBGJQ is correct, uh, in an Islamic state it will not be accepted because it is the Sharia. So Sharia overrides consensus and overrides what the ruler wants. Uh, the ruler is subject to God, but um, in a secular state this is not true. The ruler decides who will be your God. So a uh, lot of people all over the Islamic world are trying to harness the power of the state to implement Islam and this is an impossible task because the state itself is antithetic to Islam so you can't use un-Islamic means to get Islamic outcomes. So I have um, provided a, a framework based on my study of Ibn Khaldun that you see what social science claims, although it's a false claim, is that we are just like physical science. We just study the uh, reality of what is happening and we don't prescribe norms. But this is not true. If you look at, unpack the ideas, then you see that there is a normative idea and then there is a positive description and then there is transformative. How do we get from our current imperfect state to the perfect state? So in Islam, we have all three. We have a normative ideal which is spelled out in the Sharia. This is what we are supposed to be like. But we recognize that people are not angels. So when we study positive, we, uh, we study actual society. And then we study what, what can be done to bring this closer to the ideal society. So one of the things that falls out of this framework is that human agency. You see, when, when you study social science, you say that uh, society is subject to these laws of supply and demand, etc., which just force everybody to do whatever the law says. We don't have any agency. We can't shape history. But this is not true. We can take history in whichever direction we want by uh, <coughs> so uh, economic teaches us that Human beings are robots and their behavior is subject to mathematical formula. This is just false. And similarly in all other, um, most of the majority social sciences, 
humans have no agency, these societies work according to certain mechanisms and rules, and uh, these, uh, we study these mechanisms to find what will happen. But if human beings have freedom, then to ask the question, what will happen tomorrow, is not valid, because what will happen tomorrow depends on what we will do today. And we have a choice to shape our future. <clears throat> so, uh, I have been working on um, Islamic economics, and the difference between my approach and the other approach is that, uh, generally speaking, other approaches take some part of capitalist economics as truth and try to mix it with uh, Islamic principles. This cannot be done. I am saying that Islamic economics should be a replacement for Western